Welcome to Creekside Online. We are so glad that you are here. So this is the first Sunday we are hosting drive-in services, but we are so excited that you have joined us here online. Maybe you are even at our drive-in services, but you had to park so far away, you're watching online on your phone right now. If this is you also, welcome. Next Sunday, we are hosting another drive-in service. And if you are planning on attending, we are going to have a decorate your car contest, prizes and everything. For those of you who will continue to join us online, you will not be left out. You can decorate your car or the front of your house, take a picture and you can post it in the comment of next week's service and you too can win a prize. Hey, I wanna let you know about a few things coming up. This Tuesday evening is another Meditating on Scripture gathering on Zoom. This time is led by Kelly Bowers. I went to the last one and I absolutely loved it. So check out our Next Steps page on the Creekside website and sign up to get the Zoom ID and password. And while you're there looking at Next Steps, I want you to look at the four different Creekside University offerings. We have two classes that will uh, be meeting online and two classes that will be meeting on the campus. This is high level training, high level teachers. Uh, you don't wanna miss this opportunity. Uh, so you can read about all of those classes online. Hey, we're trying to do something new today. If you're watching a Creekside service for the first time, we would love it if you would text the word guest to 888-111. And we would love to chat with you and get to know you personally and also fill you in on any information you would like to know about Creekside. If you need some prayer, you can text the words need prayer to 888-111. And again, a live person will give you a call uh, to pray with you over the phone. So don't go through these tough times alone. We are here for you. You can also text to give. Use text the word give to 916-347-9191. So we can reach more guests and reach hurting people in our community. I want to encourage anyone watching this service to share this video on your social media site. It is the best way to reach more people with the hope that only God can give. Hey, just a few words about today's service. We're gonna have a time of worship. Pastor Scott has a great message on how Christ shows himself to us through the setup of the tabernacle in the desert. This will lead directly to a time of communion where we remember Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. A journey through the tabernacle takes us to the very heart and presence of God. And that's exactly what Jesus did for us on the cross. So how appropriate that this journey is gonna take us as well to the heart of God as we celebrate communion together. So you may wanna gather some kind of juice and bread and have it on hand. But again, we are so glad that you joined us. Let's worship together. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger The King of glory, the King above all kings Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder And leaves us breathless in awe and wonder The King of glory, the King above all kings this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. All you've done for me. Who brings our chaos? Sing it. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance The King of glory, the King above 
for kings. Sing it. This is amazing grace.
Let's sing that out. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. For those of you that aren't able to make it out to our drive-in services, either this week or next, I just want to say I miss you. I miss seeing you a lot. Uh, I also want to thank those that have given or helped prepare food or distributed food to the homeless here. Even during COVID-19, we've had an army of people out serving all the homeless we can find in the Elk Grove area, and we're just so grateful for your efforts also want to thank those of you that continue to give faithfully to the church because our offerings has dropped a little bit since COVID started, but not a lot. And that's because of the faithfulness of our people in giving. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, what we want to do today is we want to build off of lessons from last week. Last week, we talked about God wanting to be in the center of the people's lives, uh, the Israelites out into the desert. We're going to build off of that. God actually told his people to build a tabernacle or a tent for them right for him right in the middle of the camp. In Exodus 25, 8, we read, Have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Because he wanted to be in close relationship with his people, just like he wants to be in close relationship with you and with me today. We have a personal God who wants to have a personalized relationship with all of us. He always wants us to be looking his way, looking towards him, thinking about him, honoring him, uh, ordering our life around him. So God wants to be central in our life. But today what we want to do is we want to, with that in mind, we want to address one of the most fundamental issues about God and human beings. And that is this, how do fallen human beings like you and I make a meaningful connection with the one and only holy God? That's a very, very big question. How do we correctly approach God? And this actually has to do with how we worship God, but how we relate to him, how we enter into relationship with him. In James chapter 4, verse 8, we read this, come near to God and he will come near to you. So how do we do that? God answered that question with the Israelites out in the desert when he told them to make a tent for him in the middle of the camp, a tabernacle, and he joined that with a couple of other institutions of the priesthood and with sacrifices. So between the tabernacle, the priesthood, and the sacrifices, we want to talk about what it meant for the Israelites to draw near to God and the implications for Christ followers today. Because some of you, you might jump to an immediate conclusion, that's just ancient history, it has nothing to do with today, and you would not be further from the truth. Because God embeds in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, he embeds eternal lessons about what it means to approach him and worship him. And we're going to find for the astute listener today, for those of you that are spiritual detectives, that what we really want to look for is how these shadows of the Old Testament cast, cast light on the future coming of the Messiah, who would be the perfect fulfillment of the tabernacle, the priesthood, and all the sacrifices. So it is your job today as we take this journey to find Jesus. And I'm just going to give you a warning ahead of time. Jesus is all over the tabernacle that was built in the desert. So let me just start with a real simple thought here, okay? What was the official name of this tent or sanctuary that God had the Israelites build for him in the middle of the camp? It's called the tabernacle 125 times, but its official meet name is the tent of meeting. That occurs 140 times in the Bible. This is a tent of meeting. Now, what does that mean? This is not rocket science that he calls it the tent of meeting. It means this is where he wanted to meet with his people, right? Think about this. 
Moses repeatedly went inside this tent and God actually met him face to face. The, the encounters were so powerful, Moses' face would glow when he came out of the tent of meeting. So lesson number one from the desert this morning or today or whenever you're watching this is, is that God wants to meet you regularly. God wants to meet with me regularly. He wants to meet with you regularly. Again, he is a personal God. That's why God told Moses on the Mount uh, of Sinai that he was to have the Israelites use their own resources to build God a tent, a tent right in the middle of the camp. It's just, this is beautiful and this is profound because it was God drawing near to his people. He was giving his people access to him. God has an open door policy with us. And we're going to see as we move on that through the work of Jesus that came centuries later, God went from limited access to himself to 24-7 access in Christ. But we'll get to that later. What an honor it would be for the Israelites to have God so close to them. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 7, we read, What other nation is so great? as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him. Again, James 4, 7, come near to God and he will come near to you. But before we just rush into the presence of a holy God, we need to talk about lesson number two, which is this. Access to God must be made according to his directives. Access to God must be made according to his directives. Yes, God loves his people. Yes, God saved his people, and he's now taken the initiative to bridge the distance between himself and his people. But that doesn't mean that we just carelessly rush in to the presence of God. He also makes it clear that he has set parameters about how we are to approach him, how we are to worship him. He sets the directives on how that happens. Remember, God is infinitely holy. And you and I, by nature, we are fallen sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. We're stained people wanting to meet a stainless, perfect God. The moral distance between you and I and God is infinite. It's like a grand canyon. So Leviticus chapter 10, verse 3 underlines this principle when it says, Among those who approach me, I will be proved holy. In the sight of all the people, I will be honored. So we can't just wing this thing. We can't just make the rules up as we go along. There are no shortcuts allowed, no making it up. Uh, you know, I can't tell you the number of times I've had people tell me um, that I encounter and when I share that I'm a Christian, uh, I've often heard, you know, when I'm ready to, to, to make my peace with God, uh, I'll do it on my own terms. And I just cringe when I hear that because that's what got people killed in the desert. If you read Leviticus chapter 10, for example, the first two sons of Aaron, who were supposed to be the high priest, and then the other would succeed his brother, they both rushed into the presence of God, did it their way, offered unauthorized fire, and God struck them down and killed them with fire. You don't just throw yourself in to the presence of God. You've got to do it God's way. The exact details, in fact, of how this tabernacle was to be built were given by Moses or given to Moses on Mount Sinai, and God expected his people to follow those plans exactly, which leads to desert lesson number three. God's earthly tabernacle was to be a copy of his heavenly tabernacle. He underlines this in, in, in both Exodus and the book of Hebrews. Let me read to you Exodus, Exodus chapter 25, verse 9. It says, Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. And then in the book of Hebrews, which does a great job of unpacking the meaning of the Old Testament, we read this in Hebrews 8, 5. Levitical priests serve at a sanctuary on earth here that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. God was very specific about how they were to build this earthly sanctuary or tabernacle. This would be the very place where heaven and earth would meet. So God set the parameters on this one. 
I want you to think about this uh, just from a practical level. Let's imagine you get an invitation to meet a very important person, whether it's a president or some a leader of a nation or some prestigious person. You don't just barge into their presence. There are There's protocol that has to be followed. Now, you multiply that a thousand times over and you begin to understand the dynamic involved here when heaven and earth are going to connect and fallen humans are going to try to meet and approach the one and only holy God. So the tabernacle or the tent of meeting, it was a shadow on earth of the good things that were to come. And among other things, as you're going to see in just a bit, it pointed forward to the Jewish Messiah. It pointed forward to Christ. Have you ever wondered when you come to church why we always pray in the name of Jesus and why we come to the Father through the sacrifice of Jesus? It is because of lessons learned by the Israelites in the desert that are transferred forward to the Christian church. You're going to see that. we, Jesus himself says, I am the way. He's speaking tabernacle language here in John 14, 6. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one approaches the Father except through me. Some of your translations say no one comes to the Father except through me. You could translate it either way. It's tabernacle language. No one approaches the Father except through the Son. All right? Why? Because the tabernacle sacrifices, they were just shadows of one future perfect sacrifice that Jesus would make on the cross. And the tabernacle priesthood was symbolic of the priesthood of Christ who would successfully intercede for us by presenting his own blood in the heavenly tabernacle. And he would deal with our sins definitively once for all. So God gave the model. God drew the plans. God gave Moses the blueprints. He blessed his people with the resources to construct this tabernacle. And he even gifted people with the artistic skills to pull it off. And if you want the details for how this tabernacle was built, just turn in your Bibles and read Exodus chapter 25, 26, and 27, as well as tw chapters 35 through 38. And there's a lot of details about this blueprint that God wanted them to follow. But don't miss the forest because a tree is in the way, okay? What God is actually doing is inaugurating an amazing chapter in human history. The Lord Almighty is about to inaugurate a constant presence on earth with his people. It's something that was lost in the Garden of Eden. He's going to gift it back to his people in the desert. And he didn't really ask for a very big tent. I mean, the, his house was only going to be 45 feet long, 15 feet wide, 15 feet tall. Then he asked for a courtyard around it, which was 150 feet long, 75 feet uh, wide. It is not a very big space. But uh, the point is, this was going to be where heaven and earth were going to actually make a vital connection, where people were going to connect with their God. And it, as I said before, was something that was lost through sin in the Garden of Eden. So what I want to do at this point is I want to take you by the hand as your tour guide. And really, I'm taking the hand of Jesus Christ, our high priest, who is our ultimate tour guide on what's going on here. And it's more than just a tour. It's an actual worship experience as we go through seven stops as we move closer and closer and closer until we're finally in the immediate presence of of God and the Holy of Holies. And by the way, that is where we will all partake of communion. We will take play, we'll take part of a common meal or a fellowship meal in fulfillment of both Old Testament sacrifice as well as what Christ did on the cross. We will partake of communion together. So let's begin our journey. And the first stop would have been at the tabernacle entrance. Okay, everybody could go there. This is a place of confession, transference, and death. It's the first stop. We go to the entrance of the tent, and a sacrifice needs to be made. There's an eternal principle that's buried in all of this desert wanderings. It's in Exodus chapter 23, verse 15, that says, No one is to appear before me empty-handed. Access to God was the most precious thing to the people of Israel, to Christians today, and therefore God wanted us to value it by bringing something of value in the exchange. Not because God needs stuff, but so that we would give this the appropriate weight or value that it deserves 
in our lives. So the worshiper would come to the entrance of the tent of meeting. They'd bring a costly sacrifice. They'd present it to the Levitical priest, which then served as go-betweens or mediators. And they would assist the worshiper in worshiping and connecting and approaching God. And it would happen that the worshiper would place his or her hands over the sacrifice, the animal sacrifice, and there would be a confession of sins followed by a spiritual transference. They would confess their sins over the animal, and God would allow a substitute to occur. He would transfer the sins of the worshiper onto the animal, and then the priest would actually slay this animal, and this animal would die on the spot. So it is a place of confession, a place of transference, and a place of death. And you need to notice the big theme that's taking place here, substitution. It's a huge theme in the Bible, and it flashes forward to Jesus Christ. The ultimate substitute, he took our sins and our punishment in our place. He is our substitutionary sacrifice so we can be right with God. And in this case, an animal would die in place of the worshiper. In our case, something even better, the Son of God would die for our eternal uh, liberation, our eternal redemption. Even today, true worshipers of God, when we, uh, when we approach the Lord, we do it by confessing our sins, agreeing with God about sin, right? Accepting Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for us and actually transferring our sins onto the Son of God. Now, I don't know if you ever noticed this, but as you draw closer and closer and closer to the immediate presence of God, one of the things that becomes clear in the desert lessons is you have more and more limited access. In other words, everybody could come to the entrance of the tent of meeting, but then only the Levites could go into the, to the courtyard, and then only certain Levites could go into the holy place, and then lastly, only the high priest could go into the holy of holies for a short period of time on one day a year, the day of atonement. So there's limited access because people are fallen and God is holy. And the good news is Jesus would open that access to 24-7 access with the sacrifice. We'll get to that later. But here's another cool twist. As you approach the immediate presence of God, even the construction materials change in their value. The poles and bases of the outer courtyard were made of bronze. The altar, the labor, bronze. As you get to the foundation of God's actual house, it's made of redemption silver. But as you look at the actual furnishings within God's house, they are made of gold, bronze far away, silver close, gold immediate presence. It is everything screams lessons about God, about worship, about approaching God. Anyways, no extra charge for that. But back to the desert, uh, only men from one tribe, the Levites, could actually mediate for the people of Israel. Okay, there was a priesthood. One out of 12 tribes was set aside to do this, to take care of the functions as priests, mediators, and go-betweens. We read in Exodus chapter 28, verse 1, Have Aaron brought to you from among the Israelites along with his sons, so they may serve me as priests. Again, in Numbers chapter 18, verse 7, But only you, Aaron, and your sons may serve as priests in connection with everything at the altar and inside the curtain. I'm giving you the service of the priesthood as a gift. Anyone else who comes near to the sanctuary is to be put to death. So 11 out of 12 tribes could not do what we're going to experience today. They could not go in to the outer courtyard of the tabernacle. And the problem is most Israelites were short and the outer curtain for looking into the tabernacle was over seven feet high. So they really didn't get an awful lot of visual access to what was going on in there. They had, to, they had to work through mediators, priests, fallen go-betweens. And those people, they had to work through, through sacrifices, they had to work through intercession, and they had to wait and they had to pray. But they were always kind of kept at a distance. They could only get so far. And so uh, we learn from this, and as you read uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, you read that the priests, certain priests could actually have the honor of offering the sacrifices of Israel on the bronze altar, and there was num numerous priests that could do that. But then only one priest, one time a year, had limited access, the high priest, to the Holy of Holies, and he would take 
the, the blood atonement into the mercy seat. And it would not just be for national forgiveness, but he would actually be asking for his own forgiveness as well, because the Levites were imperfect people like you and I. They were sinners. They were fallen. That is why, um, and this is an interesting little detail. If you, if you study some of the details, there's a strong Jewish tradition that says that when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, other priests would tie a rope around his ankle. And you wonder, why did they do that? It's because if the high priest failed in his function to obtain Israel's forgiveness in the Holy of Holies and God struck that individual dead, nobody would dare go in after him. And so what did they do to get his dead body? <laughs> they just pulled him out with a rope. Nobody was going to go in there because they weren't allowed in there. Jesus would change all that with his blood sacrifice at Calvary. And again, we'll get to that. These human priests, they died. They were replaced by other people. So their mediation was only temporary and the mediation problems continued until we get an eternal high priest who never sinned, whose intercession is ongoing. Oh God, there's just got to be a better way to draw near you. And that's lesson number four in the desert. We need better, more permanent mediation with God than what the Old Testament system offers. And that's exactly what we find in Jesus Christ. The New Testament tells us that all who trust in Jesus Christ have a better, more permanent, perfect go-between mediator with the Father in the Son, Jesus. He took his own perfect blood beyond the veil into the heavenly tabernacle to obtain something that could not be obtained through the Old Testament system of sacrificing goats, lambs, and bulls. He busted open immediate access to the Father through all of us, through his ultimate once and for all sacrifice. You and I now have a constant open door policy with the Father, 24-7 access to get close. And the Father repeatedly says, come, come into my presence. Unlike the priest of the Old Testament, our new high priest, he's from a higher order. He doesn't sin like the Levitical priests. Note that, people. It's not just the sacrifice of Christ who saves us. It is his perfect life that makes him a worthy sacrifice. Jesus never sinned, and because he now is resurrected and lives forever, he never dies. And so his intercession and his mediation as our high priest is infinitely better than anything they could have had in the Old Testament system. So Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament system of the priesthood and the sacrifices, and then he set it aside. Because perfect holy blood not only covers our sins like the Old Testament, we are told in the New Testament, it takes our sins away forever, once and for all. Let me read to you a very cool passage about this in Hebrews chapter 7. Beginning of verse 23, this is what we read. Now there have been many of these Levitical priests since death prevented them from continuing in office, but because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other, other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all, when he offered himself. Jesus is both our high priest and our sacrifice. That's why we read in 1 John 2, 2, once again, tabernacle language. The apostle John says this, he says, Jesus Christ is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, let's get back to our uh, our journey into the heart of God, into the Holy of Holies. And the next step after we go from the entrance of the Tent of Meeting is the bronze altar. It's a, And it represents substitutionary sacrifice. This next step is done by priests, mediation, right, who would offer the sacrifice of the worshipers on this big bronze altar. Bronze is the medal of judgment, and that's exactly what happens. A substitute takes place. Death takes place here. The burning of the sacrifice. Sin requires judgment and death. Remember, the wages of sin is death. 
Nobody rushes into God's immediate presence without adequately dealing with sin, and sin exacts a very high price. Again, Exodus 23, 15, no one is to appear before me empty-handed. And now I don't want to get too detailed on this one, but for those of you who love the details, read Leviticus chapter 1 through 7. It offers us five specific sacrifices that worshipers had to offer God. God was so serious about this that he gave adaptions to these sacrifices for poor people so that everybody among the Israelites could do this because this is how people connected with God. Uh, and, and these sacrifices were the burnt offering, okay? That's a, that would be a total surrender, the sin offering that would be made to obtain forgiveness, the guilt offering that was a cleansing of the conscience, then the grain offering and the work offering, which would be the first fruits or efforts of their labor, and then finally the fellowship offering or shared meal, shared meal with God. And that's exactly what we're going to do today. We're going to see Jesus fulfill the first four sacrifices and then invite us all to partake of the final sacrifice, a shared meal with the Father. So I don't want you to miss this. Jesus fulfilled all these necessary sacrifices when he died on the cross, okay? That is why we always pray and approach the Father in the name and through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Again, Jesus said, no one approaches the Father except through me. It's a very exclusive approach that God has designated here. So what does that mean? Uh, in the burnt offering, Jesus offered himself first in total surrender. In the sin offering, Jesus Christ died to secure our forgiveness on the cross. In the, in the uh, guilt offering, Jesus' shed blood was sufficient to cleanse our consciences. Jesus' perfect work on Calvary and the cross was the fruit of his labor that he gave to us. And so all of the things that were required in the Old Testament have been fulfilled in Christ. And that's why the Old Testament priests and sacrifices have now been set aside. They were just imperfect shadows that pointed forward to a perfect, complete fulfillment in Christ. Well, we better get back to our journey into the heart of God, into the heart of this tabernacle or tent of meeting. The next step past the bronze altar would be the washing laver. It also was made of bronze. And it symbolized cleansing and purification that would take place. Again, New Testament writers like John pick up on this tabernacle language, like in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us or cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So at the laver, we see Jesus and his cleansing. Okay, now, once we receive that cleansing, once we receive that washing and purification, we now approach the outer curtain of God's actual house or his tent. And that serves as the entryway into what is called the holy place. Now, once inside, your, your eyes, my eyes, immediately turn to the left where we see this huge seven-stemmed golden candelabra. Okay, this is the first time we're being overwhelmed with gold because we're inside God's house. The golden candelabra, which represents light to live by or illumination, or if you will, guidance. Remember, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And just as the eye, just as the eye cannot see without light, so the soul cannot see without the revelation and the guidance of the Lord Jesus Christ. We turn to the right, we see the temp or, or the table of showbread, also made of gold, 12 different loaves of bread there, each representing the different tribes of Israel. And we are reminded that this is bread to live by. This is provision. This is a constant reminder that God will provide for all of our needs along the journey as we move towards his presence. Okay, remember, Jesus not only said, I'm the light of the, earth, light of the world, he said, I'm also the bread of life, the fulfillment of both of these furnishings we see in the holy place, okay? And then we move forward to the golden altar of incense, which represents intercession to live by, Christ's prayer. You might think, intercession to live by, and here's what I have to say about that. There's no way that you and I could make it all the way into the immediate presence of the Father unless Jesus carried us unless Jesus has assisted us, unless he prayed us through on this successful faith journey. Otherwise, we could not make it. Intercession to live by. And uh, the, 
as we're there looking at this altar of incense, it was probably about, about belly high, and there was this constant incense that was placed there morning and evening, and it was burned. It was a beautiful aroma used only for God. Nobody else could use it. That was a constant symbol of the prayers of of the of the mediation of Christ, but even our own prayers that intermingle with the intercessory prayers of Jesus Christ. What a beautiful picture we have here. For our own good, the Father draws us forward on our faith journey by listening to and responding and answering and helping us because of the intercession of Christ at the golden altar of incense. After we've finished intermingling our intercessory prayer with the intercessory prayer of Christ, because we are called to be prayer people as well, it's at this point that we've completed six of the seven stops on our journey into the immediate presence of God. And it's at this point that our hands begin to shake and our legs and knees begin to become a little bit wobbly because what we're going to do is we're going to join hands with our high priest and we're going to push aside the curtain, the inner curtain, or the veil, it's called, and we're actually going to step into the immediate presence of God in the Holy of Holies. As you push this curtain aside, what you see is a perfectly cubed room. It's 15 feet long, 15 feet wide, 15 feet high. All right, it's not very big. But one of the first things you notice is there is no source of light in this room. There's no candelabra, there's no sun, there's no open windows, and yet this particular room is perfectly illuminated. Remember, when you are in the presence of God, you are in the presence of where light originated. This room is lit by the very presence of God. It's called the Shekinah glory of God. It's a little intimidating, but remember, even in heaven, no secondary lights. Everything in the city that we're headed to will be lit by the presence of God. And the second thing you notice is there's only one piece of furniture furniture in this entire room, and that's the Ark of the Covenant. And it's covered by a lid, which is called the mercy seat. And at this point, it represents access to God. It represents forgiveness. It represents salvation. Now, inside this ark, which was a kind of a long box, you remember it from Harrison Ford's movies, Raider, Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? Inside this ark was a golden container of the manna, which spoke of God's continuous provision for his people. It was also the budded rod of Aaron, which spoke of our need for mediation when we approach God. But most importantly were two tablets or tables, that had the very words of God, the Ten Commandments on them that were written by the finger of God. And those were inside the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, these are laws that nobody in all history has been able to live up to perfectly. No one until Jesus Christ. Now, on top of the Ark, is a lid that covers it. It's all covered with gold, right? And on this lid are two seraphim, a, a kind of angel that have their, their wings turned inside, prostrate before God. And there in the middle of this, this lid is what's known as the mercy seat. It would be like essentially God's throne where he would sit on earth. But what's important to notice is here's the broken laws of God here. And here's the holy God here. And what the high priest would do one time a year is he would spread blood right there on the mercy seat so that it would come between a holy God and his broken laws so that his people could receive forgiveness. What a beautiful picture this is. But remember, that was done with the blood of bulls, goats, and, and sheep. Those are involuntary sacrifices that didn't know what's coming. We, on the other hand, have the perfect Son of God who entered into the heavenly tabernacle and placed his own blood on the mercy seat so that he would not just cover sin, but he would completely take it away once for all. That is why the first time that John the Baptist sees Jesus publicly, he says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Notice, he doesn't cover it. He takes it away, and it's not he takes away the sins of the world. He removes sin from the world for all who would believe this. What a gift we have 
in Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is our perfect mediator and sacrifice. He's now standing in the presence of, we're all standing in the presence of God. It's the desert, it's the wilderness, and God has lovingly showed his people how they are to approach him, how they are to worship him, how they are to draw near to him in faith and surrender and worship. And so, you know, I, I, I could ask you to fill in a bunch of blanks right now, but I'd rather have you focus on communing with God since we're in the Holy of Holies. But let me just say that there are certain desert lessons that are screaming at us at this point. If you want to approach God today, if I want to approach God today and connect with him through faith and worship, we need to understand God wants that to happen. We need that for our own lives to live by. It is very costly. The conditions are only set by God. It requires mediation, and such a connection also requires sacrificial substitutionary blood. And that blood has to be from a perfect victim. That is why we have the gospel. It is good news. Jesus gives us 24-7 access to the Father. The veil has been torn when Jesus died on the cross. Hallelujah. Wow. When you get into the very presence of God, what is there left to do? Everything has been fulfilled, and it is now time to partake in a shared fellowship meal with the Father. Jesus even fulfilled that by offering us the symbols of his body and his blood that we may approach the, the Father with the Son and actually commune in fellowship with him. People, that's the birthing of future communion in the church, right there, lessons in the desert. So you probably received some kind of communication this week that we were going to partake of communion today for those that weren't able to come to our drive-in services, okay? So we're assuming that you've uh, acquired some form of bread and also some form of cup so that we can partake of that. If not, you may want to pause this video long enough to find those elements, and then we'll pick this back up, okay? So let's begin with our thoughts about the bread and this communal fellowship meal with the Lord. I think it's important for us to remember that this represents the sacrifice. Remember, it's broken bread, so it represents the sacrifice of Jesus's broken body on the cross for you and me, and how he wonderfully fulfilled all the requirements of the law for you and for me. And so we believe that by faith, Jesus Christ becomes our high priest mediator, go between us and the Father, offering us perfect mediation. We believe as we partake of this bread that Jesus Christ also makes peace with us, with the Father through his sacrifice on the cross. We believe by faith that Jesus Christ also becomes our burnt offering, our sin offering, our guilt offering, our work or grain offering, offering himself in entirety, securing our forgiveness, cleansing our conscience, and even offering his perfect work in our place on the Christ. Cross has, Christ has done all this for us. The bronze altar reminds us that Jesus was completely consumed on the cross in our place. The washing labor reminds us that Jesus Christ offers us cleansing. The candelabra, Jesus offers us light, guidance, illumination. The table of showbread, Jesus offers us provision for the journey so we make it all the way to our destination. The altar of incense, he's praying us through in our journey. And so we come to this bread and I would ask that you take a portion of this bread. And with this, we remember in extreme gratitude to our mediator, our high priest, and our sacrifice, how grateful we are for this provision that buys us 24-7 access to the Holy God and makes peace between us and the Father. With that in mind, let us partake of this together. O oh Lord, we thank you that you make these provisions available and how Jesus is the perfect shadow and fulfillment of everything. He's not the shadow. He fulfills all the shadows of the Old Testament and makes our access to you perfect and complete. And so we do this in remembrance of you. And now we ask that you take the cup. 
And I took you just a minute ago through the first six stops. The seventh stop was when our perfect mediator, Jesus Christ, went into the Holy of Holies in the heavenly tabernacle. And instead of offering the blood of goats or bulls, he actually offered his own blood on the mercy seat above the Ark of the Covenant. And not only covers our sins by that, but takes them away forever. Hallelujah. And so, Jesus, as we look at this symbol, we remember the blood you shed on the cross, and we are eternally grateful for what that blood means to us and what it purchased for us. We thank you. Now let us partake of the cup together. Father, we thank you for giving us permission to approach you in Christ. We thank you for making it easier than it was in the Old Testament. And I would pray, Lord, that now that we realize you have an open-door policy and we have 24-7 access, that we would regularly come into your presence because you want it and we live by it. We pray this in Jesus' name, our mediator, our high priest, and our perfect sacrifice. Amen. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin Jesus is calling Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ.
Again, thanks for joining us. We're so glad that you have joined us here at Creekside Online. But I want to give you a blessing this morning. On the count of three, we're going to put our hands together. Ready? One, two, three. As you have seen the tabernacle, know that God is longing to point his people. He's longing to point you directly to his heart. So may you journey to the very heart of God and find his presence and find his peace. Pack that up, put his peace in your heart. God bless. Have a great day.